Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. So excited for this video as we're back with another 2024 NBA mock draft and I am stoked. First off, the first thing I need to address, everywhere on Twitter right now, I'm seeing people who call themselves draft analysts saying this draft is extremely weak and I need to put a stop to that immediately. First of all, if I believe that, I wouldn't record videos on it. Why would I want to talk about something that I don't think is going to be long-term impactful? I don't believe that. The last time we went through a cycle where everyone said, oh, this is a super weak draft. It's like a one or two player draft. That was malarkey. That draft was 2020, which produced Anthony Edwards, LaMelo Ball, Tyrese Halliburton, Desmond Bain, and a whole bunch of other good players, high level NBA players that impact winning every single night in the league. 2024 is going to be very, very similar. Now it might not have an Anthony Edwards or a Tyrese Halliburton because those two guys are so, so, so darn good, but it's going to have a lot of good NBA players. It's going to have a lot of impactful NBA players and players who are gonna impact winning. And I'm so tired of seeing on my timeline, well, in a weak 2024 NBA draft, this draft is weak relative to 2023 because it doesn't have a Victor Wembanyama. Heck, it might not have a Brandon Miller or a Scoot Henderson or an Amin Thompson. But that doesn't mean there's not good players in here. And you have to really trust your eyes. You have to trust your intuition and your gut feeling on, hey, look, this guy's going to impact winning at the NBA level. And I think there's a vast collection of players that are going to be able to do that. You just have to trust your eyes and really know what you're looking at to identify those guys, which is what makes this cycle so much fun. With that mini rant over, make sure you guys leave a like, subscribe for more content here at Utility Sports. I'm so excited for this draft cycle. Last week I was feeling really under the weather. Couldn't get a video out. Unfortunately, I've been ready to record this for weeks. I've just been kind of waiting to feel really at my best so that I can give you guys the best content possible. And by the way, this mock draft is based on the standings as of December 11th. So the morning of December 11th, for me personally, I take multiple days to formulate a mock draft. So there's a lot of thought time that goes into this. I can't just rip it off in one little setting. That's just not how this works for me. So because of that, the standings may be outdated by a day or two. By the time you see this, that's not a big deal. Okay, really all we're talking about is what players would fit where, why would a team consider which guy? And the first team picking here in this mock draft is the Detroit Pistons who are on a 20 game losing streak. They've been terrible this season. Um, I don't think that that is uh, a surprise to anyone. <laughs> the Pistons have been really disappointing. Monty Williams is getting paid a heck of a lot of money and it hasn't translated to a lot of wins so far, which is okay. It's not the end of the world that the Pistons are bad. It is concerning that they're this bad though. And part of that is they just don't have shooting and Troy Weaver hasn't valued free agency. They've had opportunities to operate with cap space. He's chosen to not do that surprisingly. And it's kind of been kicking the can down the road of, hey, we're just gonna keep waiting for the young guys. And at some point you have to start seeing some steps forward. Detroit hasn't seen that so far. I think pick one is really wide open in this draft, depending on which team gets the first pick. Although there is one player that I think more teams would consider than other teams, uh, or than other players, excuse me. And, and that player here is who I have the Detroit Pistons going with. First overall, the Detroit Pistons select Alex Saar from the NBL playing for the Perth Wildcats. I love Alex Saar's game for a variety of reasons. He's a really good defensive prospect. He actually spent time in the overtime elite program as well. His brother currently plays in the NBA for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, that is Olivier Saar, and he's an impressive player by himself as well. He's an athlete who can protect the rim. Alex Saar is like a, a souped up version of him. A little bit quicker, a little bit twitchier out in space, a little bit better hip mobility, uh, hip fluidity. And really, I think Alex Saar, one of the things about him that really impresses me in his draft tape is a lot of functional athleticism for his size. And what do I mean by that? He's a seven footer who can change direction. And that is really, really rare. Anytime you look at a lot of seven footers, think about like one of the better seven footers in the league, Carl Anthony Towns. Him changing directions is a little spotty on a night to night basis where, you know, it takes him a little bit to flip his hips and get downhill, especially in the defensive end. Alex Sar is the complete opposite of that. And that's what makes him so exciting. You know, people are going to say, oh, this is a weak draft class. Listen, five years from now, everyone's going to be saying, wow, how do we get an Alex Sar on our team? And I think that's what's really fun about this draft cycle is if you know what you're looking at, you know that a guy like Alex Sar can be really, really good 
long term. Now, he's not a, a polished product. He's not like Victor Wembanyama, where he's going to come into the league averaging 20 points a game, 10 rebounds a night. No, it's going to be a little bit more of a developmental pathway for him. That doesn't mean it's a bad draft. That doesn't mean there aren't good players in this draft. And I think Alex R is going to end up becoming a very good player. And for Detroit, drafting Alex R is a little funky because they don't need another big man. They don't need less shooting, which this doesn't really help some of their needs, but it's just he's too good to pass on. And the other player I consider for them is kind of a, a ball dominant guard. And because of that, I don't know how that fits around Cade Cunningham. So I went with the player that I thought was probably the best long-term fit for them, even though I don't love his fit in Detroit. I don't love the fit of a lot of guys that you would pick necessarily first overall. Typically, you're not looking for a shooter at pick one. I think for Detroit long-term, if you're looking to build this team out, it's all about trying to find guys who can shoot, dribble, and pass. And it sounds pretty obvious. Oh, you want good basketball players? Yeah, that's where the league's at. Detroit doesn't have enough of that right now, specifically in the shooting department. They've got a lot of intriguing athletes. They've got a lot of intriguing skill sets. Just unfortunately, a lot of their skill sets overlap and they don't really complement each other. Alex R doesn't help as much in that area, but he's just such an intriguing prospect. I still think he's worth the first overall pick nonetheless. Now moving on to pick number two, we have the Washington Wizards here and I can't believe how much national discourse there is around the Washington Wizards currently. For a team that's been overlooked for years and years and years, felt like I was the only one talking about Washington for the last two or three seasons on YouTube. And all of a sudden, everyone loves to jump on and say, wow, those Washington Wizards, screw them for tanking. No, this is good. Washington is doing the best thing they possibly can right now, tanking. I know Wizards fans, a lot of you guys are losing, you know, patience. You guys, you guys gotta be patient here. Michael Winger, Listen, everything he's doing is on a, a three to four or five year timeline. I know first couple of years, it's going to suck. You guys are going to be terrible. You're not going to win very many games. There's not going to be a lot of reasons to go to games. And honestly, watching on TV might not be the most fun. I promise you though, three, four years from now, you're going to look back and say, man, I wish I watched that 2023 Wizards team. They're not good, but they would have been fun to talk about two or three years from now. Hey, remember when Jordan Poole was isoing 15 times a game? Remember when Kyle Kuzma was shooting tween behind the backs and just playing his style? Listen, Wizards fans, you got to have fun here. But here's a player that's going to really, I think, accelerate this rebuild. And honestly, right now, if it came down to it at the end of the draft cycle, if this was, if today was the last day of the draft cycle and I had to give my number one player in the class, it would be this guy. Nikola Topic, uh, playing in Mega Basket right now. This guy is impressive, and it's got to be something about the first name Nikola because they keep getting more and more talented. We had Vucevic, then Jokic, and then, you know, obviously there's a lot of love for all the Nikolas right now. Jovic has gotten some love in, in Miami. I think Topic is the real deal, though, here. He's somebody who you can be comfortable putting the ball in his hands. He can go and find a shot, not only for himself, but for others, and that's really what separates him from some of the other players in the draft is... If you're looking at players who you could potentially build an offense around, Nikola Topic is maybe the sole prospect in this entire draft that you could really see that being successful for an NBA franchise. Alex Sar is a guy that the reason he went first overall in this draft is because you could build a defense around him. I think that's really possible. I think Topic, a player you can build an offense around. Now, I'm a little bit less confident in Topic's offense than I am in Sar's defense. I think Sar's defense is really, really legit. But if there's a player, if you told me five years from now that one player in this draft became a true all-NBA offensive player, my assumption currently would be Nikola Topic is that guy because of his ability to make reads. He's able to pass from you know right-handed drives all the way to the left corner or vice versa. Um, and he's really quick as well. I think that's one of the most underrated elements of his game is his change of sp uh, change of pace specifically. Um, we've seen guards who, yes, quick guards are really, really good to have. But the nuance of, hey, I can go slow too fast is what makes a guard elite. We've seen De'Aaron Fox really ramp up his game. He didn't get faster. He got better at utilizing his quickness in short areas. And I think Nikola Topic already has that feel, similar to a Luka Doncic. Now, he's not Doncic. He's, I'm not saying he's going to average 30, 10, and 10. What I'm saying is he could be a very, 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 very good player, though, especially on the offensive end, someone you're comfortable putting the ball in his hands. And because of that, Washington, you finally are going to have a guy that isn't turnover prone and you feel like, hey, this guy's going to be able to orchestrate our offense. He's a, a phenomenal building block around a guy like Bilal Koulibaly. Topic has good positional size as well. I like his game a lot. Um, he's just been absolutely dominant as the number one option for his team overseas and I think that's something that should give a lot of confidence to teams not only because he's been 
excelling, the team's been winning as well. Now moving on to pick three, and we have the San Antonio Spurs who had their own losing streak going. Um, you know, obviously I talked about the Pistons losing streak already. The Wizards had a big losing streak. Well, the Spurs themselves weren't immune to that. And even with Victor Wembanyama, the whole point Jeremy Sohan thing isn't working. I think that's by design. I think the Spurs are tanking. Now, I didn't say that out loud because I don't want the NBA to find them or anything crazy like that. But that's really what's happening here, to be honest. Um, but with Isaiah Collier, um, which is who they're going to pick here, um, I kind of spoiled the pick. I think that that's a real point guard for them. And I think Trey Jones being a long-term backup point guard is excellent. And I think Collier specifically, his ability to find downhill space, really he has a mentality that he's not going to be stopped when it comes to getting to the rim. And I think if the Spurs, as they kind of get better and better, as they kind of go throughout Wembenyama's career, they're going to realize Victor at center is unstoppable. And if we have a good point guard who can pass, we're going to be really, really difficult to beat. And I think Isaiah Collier fits that bill for them out of USC. Now there are moments that I'm not in love with Collier's game. He's a really hesitant three-point shooter. I would not rely on him right now to hit NBA three-pointers consistently. He kind of gives me some Eric Bledsoe vibes, if I'm being honest, but a less vertically athletic, less explosive Eric Bledsoe. And you might be saying, oh my God, third overall, a less explosive Eric Bledsoe. Listen, Collier's defensive intensity isn't there. There's a lot of flaws in Collier's game currently. You can tell he views himself as a one and done prospect. He isn't putting in maximum effort for USC in my opinion. When I watch the film on him, I, there's been moments where I'm not impressed. Uh, but the passing feel is real. And because of that, just like I talked about with Topic, when you have a guy who you feel comfortable putting the ball in their hands, that separates them from other players in a draft class. To me, I think Isaiah Collier has a massive ceiling. If the shot making comes around, he's going to be really, really, really good. I think he has the tools defensively to become good. He's strong. Uh, he's got really good hands. And I think defensively, like as long as he's positionally focused, he could be good because of his size. He's big, strong, physical. He's built like a linebacker. I think because of that, you could build something with that. And also having Victor Wembanyama behind him won't, help, won't hurt either. I think this is one of the better outcomes for San Antonio, honestly. If they walk out of this draft with one of Sar, Topic, or Collier, I feel like I love it for them for sure just because you're either getting a freakish defensive prospect or two offensive prospects that fit your best player now in Victor Wembenyama. Moving on to pick four, we have the Memphis Grizzlies, and boy, have they been disappointing. I just have not been enamored with what I've seen from Memphis, and a big part of that is they're playing Jaron Jackson Jr. a lot more at center than they are at power forward, and I think this is one of the reasons why last year I thought, look, Memphis, and, and specifically Jaron Jackson Jr., should not have won Defensive Player of the Year. I don't look at him as an anchor. I look at him as a shot blocker, and I think there's a big difference between those two things. But the nice thing for Memphis is they're going to get some of their centers back. Steven Adams hopefully comes back next season. You're also going to have Brandon Clark hopefully come back at some point this season. That kind of reshapes your rotations, reshapes the roles for a guy like Jaron Jackson Jr. And then also John Morant returning kind of reshapes your offensive outlook as well in terms of how many shots does Desmond Bain have to create. Having John Morant's down downhill athleticism kind of just completely transforms your offense. So what's a player that realistically fits around their core still? And I think you have to highlight the small forward position. And with the fourth overall pick here, I have the Memphis Grizzlies selecting Zachary Risa Cher out of France. And he's having a really good season for himself playing overseas right now. At about six foot ten, he is shooting well above 40% from behind the three-point line. He's had a lot of really good moments this season in his league and the French born prospect I think has <clears throat> a lot to offer to an NBA team when you look at a player his size his ability to stretch the floor is pretty rare but he's kind of got fluidity in his hips that you wouldn't associate with a power forward I look at him more as kind of a, a tweener forward can play the three will play the four a bit in the NBA just with the way that teams value skill and, and size and length um, at certain positions I think he'll fit as a four in certain lineups but I think he's capable of being a, a small forward for a team based on his skill set and when you have a tweener forward like that there's real versatility from a guy like Zachary Risa 
uh, share. And, and when you're looking at one thing Memphis needs to do really, really well around John Morant and around Jaron Jackson Jr. and around Steven Adams, it's shoot the basketball. Obviously, Desmond Bain is a big time contributor to that, but I think Risa Share could really help kind of bolster their starting lineup. And I think for him specifically, he's really what they would have wanted to get out of Zaire Williams, an athletic tweener forward who can defend across multiple positions and can shoot the basketball. I think Risa Share is a much better version of Zaire Williams. I think he's going to become a very good starter in the NBA at some point. And I think because of that, Risa Share is a guy that if Memphis takes fourth overall, they would be extremely happy with the long-term results from that selection. Now at pick number five, we have the Portland Trailblazers here. And Portland's one of my favorite teams to mock because I have a pretty good feel for what Mike Schmitz is really evaluating and analyzing when he's on the clock. And They've done a good job drafting. I know a lot of people are going to say, oh my gosh, you know, Scoot Henderson this, Scoot Henderson that, he's not playing. Listen, it's it's that way for every guard. Coming in, first year typically, outside of like Luka Doncic, guys don't come in and just dominate the NBA, especially from a point guard position. Scoot Henderson, it's going to take a year, but then year two, year three is when we're going to see that big leap forward and people are going to say, yeah, this is why this guy was a top three pick in the draft and probably you could argue should have been a top two pick in the draft. He is just going to become incredible at some point. It hasn't happened yet. Portland's kind of a, a collection of misfit items right now. They'll figure it out. I'm not panicked at all. And a player that I think is going to help connect some of those you know, kind of misfit pieces I have them here fifth overall selecting Matas Buzelis from G League Ignite. He missed the first seven or eight games of the season for G League Ignite, and they went winless without him. They just could not buy a win in the G League. And in fact, there was a lot of games that were getting blown out, including the opener of the season. They lost by over 50 points to the Salt Lake City Stars. But with Matas Buzelis back in his very first game, he had a pretty nice performance. They ended up actually picking up a win. And I think Buzelis is just a guy who's going to contribute to winning. At 6'10", he's got an ability to put the ball in the deck, handle it a bit. I've seen some crazy takes on Twitter. Um, when I talk about, you know, these are things I'm not subscribed to, not following, just happen to come across on my timeline. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy thinks Matas Buzelis is the 17th best player in the draft. That, like, I just can't, I don't understand that line of thinking. To me, I think Matas Buzelis has a very similar skill set to Franz Wagner, who has been lighting it up this year for the Orlando Magic and I was actually low on Franz Wagner in his draft that's one of my bigger draft misses in recent history and I have no problem admitting that I've learned from it and I think for me I can appreciate a guy like Matas Buzelis because he's been very very impressive from the film I've seen he's able to knock down jump shots he's able to play off the catch he's able to cut he's also able to handle the basketball but you could run him through a pick and roll as a primary ball handler. And I think with his size, length, and skill set, there's so much versatility that it offers that if you're a team like Portland when you're trying to piece together your young core, what fits well off of a Shane Sharp? What fits well off of a Scoot Henderson? A guy like Montez Buzelis who can do a little bit of everything, I think does go a long way, but he's still got the upside with his size, ball handling capabilities, shot making ability. I still think Montez Buzelis is a guy who honestly fifth overall, you might be getting a bargain here coming into this draft cycle. I had him as a potential number one pick. The kind of growth we've seen from Topic and Alex R specifically have really impressed me in their overseas campaigns so far to the point where I would no longer believe Buzelis is worth the number one pick just at this point from what we've seen. But he was in that conversation. I think that there was you know, real legitimacy to him being in that conversation when he was. And I like Buzelis. I think that there's some real talent um, there. And I think the Blazers get a player who is going to be really, really good in the league for a very long time. Pick six, we have the Utah Jazz now, and sorry for the uh, neon highlighter yellow, but that's their color. They chose that, not me. And if you're a Jazz fan, you've got to be pretty jazzed up, I would say, about your guys' long-term future. Now, listen, this year's been a, a step back. That is intentional. That is by design for Utah. With them starting Keontae George, the entire point is development right now. They're putting Keontae George in a spot where, look, he's not Mike Conley, like what Mike Conley was a year ago, someone who would handle the basketball, not turn it over, get you into sets. Keontae George is doing a lot of learning right now, and, and head coach Will Hardy's been very clear about that, that honestly, the expectation isn't to win right now, and that's a good thing. If you're a Utah Jazz fan, you should be super happy about your long-term direction because you have all of the draft picks in the world. You took some good upside young players like Taylor Hendricks, Keontae George, Bryce Sensaba. You've got some nice young pieces. You have Lowry Markinen still, Walker Kessler, I think starting to look more like himself this season as well. The team is pretty solid. Now, I know you guys aren't winning a lot. You're picking sixth overall for a reason, but with this selection, 
I think it's all about upside and what could I see Danny Ainge taking and it's an athletic wing who has scoring potential and for that reason I have the Utah Jazz here at 6th overall selecting Ron Holland. Another G League Ignite player goes here back to back selections actually after Buzelis. Holland goes next and Holland was also a player who was in firm consideration for the number one pick and I still think that depending on how his season finishes here for the G League Ignite he could definitely still climb up into that top three-ish maybe top two-ish depending on how teams view Nikola Topic, how teams view SAR specifically. And it's really going to come down to, at the end of the day, how does an individual GM feel about a player? Because with how open this class is, we might get a 2013 situation where the Cavaliers land on Anthony Bennett to be the first pick. Now, I'm not saying Holland's going to be Bennett. I think Holland's a lot better than Anthony Bennett. And I think Holland has some real skills that translate to NBA scoring. He right now is putting up massive numbers for the G League Ignite when it comes to scoring. Unfortunately, though, he's turning the ball over a ton as well. He turns the ball over more than he gets assists. Um, I think his handle's rather inconsistent right now. There's reasons that in this mock draft for me, he fell to six. Um, despite all of the upside, despite the physical tools, the scoring skill set that he has, uh, there's things he needs to get better at. Uh, his attention to detail and defense needs to be a lot better. Um, right now, I would classify him as a defensive playmaker, and he's opportunistic. I would never, ever consider him a stopper. I would not consider him a very good defender. Um, and I'm not saying he won't be. I think he has the skills and the athleticism and the traits to become that. It's just we have to see it and he has to apply himself on that end. And that's, and that's something for a lot of young scorers. They, they struggle to stay locked in on that end of the floor. But I think if you find the best version of Ron Holland, he is a player who he's making a bunch of defensive plays as a defensive playmaker. He gets opportunistic stops when you need him really to. And he's someone who's scoring 20 points a game in the NBA. And that's a good player. That's a very, very good player. And that's what shocks me about people saying, well, this is a weak draft and it's not a good draft. I mean, if you get a 20 point per game score, sixth overall in a draft, you're pretty darn happy about it. And I think Ron Holland could become that. I think the Jazz here get an upside player that makes sense, fits their roster construction. They need another wing who can score the basketball. Um, and it's really for him about limiting turnovers, getting better at making progressions off the live dribble, and, and just really kind of improving his all-around game. He's comfortable as a scorer right now, but if he gets to new levels as a shot maker, it would just take his game to a whole new level. And I think that's what we're hoping to see out of Ron Holland toward the back half of this draft cycle. Pick number seven now, we have the Charlotte Hornets here, and they've got an interesting thing going. Terry Rozier is playing some really great basketball this season. LaMelo Ball, obviously out with an injury right now, but he was playing magnificently before he got hurt. Uh, Brandon Miller is averaging about 14 points a game as a rookie. He's having a, a good rookie season. Glad to see that. And Mark Williams is starting to come into his own a little bit. The, you can see the pieces in Charlotte. It's just all about them clicking together and, and kind of finding a mesh that fits and works really well that translates to wins. And so far, Charlotte hasn't done that consistently or reliably. But here at this pick, I think they're going to find a player that fits really smoothly off of LaMelo Ball. And I have them going here seventh overall with Jacoby Walter out of Baylor. He's shooting about 39% from three as a freshman, shooting about 42% from the field or so. His very first game with Baylor, he actually put up a 28 point performance, which set a Baylor freshman debut record. Very impressive game from him. And he's continued some of his great performances for Baylor. He's been pretty instrumental as a catch and shoot guy. Obviously he's taken steps forward as an off the dribble shooter. And I think he's somebody who, his skill set is just needed around the NBA. Anytime you can find a guy who can shoot the basketball well, there's a role for them somewhere in the league. And I think Jacob Kobe Walter is going to fit right in with Charlotte. Obviously, didn't mention Miles Bridges yet either. He's played pretty well since coming uh, back from his suspension. We'll see what his long-term future looks like there in Charlotte. But I think finding another wing who can shoot at the, you know, kind of long-term outlook of this team. You have LaMelo Ball, who's a really great shooter. Brandon Miller, who's going to become a very, very, very good shooter in the NBA. And then Jacoby Walter. I mean, you have three guys who are absolute lasers from behind the three-point line, kind of constituting your backcourt. That's a really good thing to have. And it's a really soundproof way to build your team because it allows you to keep looking for best player available when you have shooters already surrounding your existing pieces. Pick number eight now, we have the biggest tire fire in the NBA, excuse me, the Chicago Bulls, I mean, um, those two things are synonymous right now. I've had so many trade videos up on the channel uh, covering the Chicago Bulls because they're just flat out not very good. And that's why they're picking eighth overall here. Honestly, I expect them to end up picking higher than eighth overall when it comes to the actual draft because this team just 
I mean, they're going to sell their pieces. DeMar DeRozan probably gets traded. Vucevic might get traded. Levine likely gets dealt as well. Maybe Caruso gets traded. And because of that, the Bulls are entering significant rebuild mode. Hopefully for them, they'll be able to recoup a bunch of draft assets and maybe accelerate the rebuild a bit. But nonetheless, eighth overall here, they have a you know a big question at one position specifically, and that's who is the long-term starting point guard for this Bulls team. Um, obviously, the Lonzo Ball injury specifically kind of destroyed their team construction. I feel really bad about that. But eighth overall, we're going to address the point guard situation. We're going to go with Stefan Castle out of UConn. He really impresses me on film. He just seems calm, cool, and collected. Um, they use him in the middle against zones, which is, I think, really unique and dynamic for a point guard to be kind of featured in that way. Um, it really shows that, hey, look, even as a freshman, they trust him. Uh, they put him in a high leverage situation, and he just makes the right plays. Just doesn't, doesn't feel rushed. Um, he's got a, a nice skill set where he's able to score on multiple levels. Uh, I think he's got the size, positional flexibility to rebound the basketball for his position. And I think he's going to end up turning into a really good NBA player for quite some time. And because of that, I think he gives Chicago some significant stability at the point guard spot as they go into the rebuild. And one thing I've always said, if you're going to draft a point guard or you're going to draft a center, you better pick them before you need them. And what I mean by that is it takes time for those positions to, de to develop specifically. It's hard to win with a rookie point guard. It's hard to win with a rookie center. So if you're Chicago and you're aiming for a four-year rebuild, potentially, getting your point guard in year one might help because by the time you're in year four, he's starting to enter maybe what we would consider his early prime. And you have a, a ball handler who you trust to not only help you win games, but also help the development of the other young guys you pick along the way. As he gains experience, he's going to also be able to help the other guys looking to gain experience. And I think that's a big thing here for Chicago with this selection. Pick number nine, we have the San Antonio Spurs again. This pick comes from the Toronto Raptors. Um, in, you know, the Yaka Pirtle trade, I thought, you know, when that trade went down, I thought the Spurs did really, really well in that. Um, I was a little perplexed by the Raptors decision. They're another team that we could watch, maybe make some trades this deadline, um, around maybe Pascal Siakam or OG Ananobi. Those are the current reports right now, but ninth overall, who do I have the Spurs going with? And remember, we already have them take Isaiah Collier out of USC. Ninth overall, I really like the selection I landed on here. I thought about it a lot. This is one of the harder picks in the draft for me. I landed on Donovan Klingon. We're going with another UConn Husky back-to-back -back picks here. Klingon, the sophomore center, is having a fantastic season. He's even attempted a couple of threes this year for UConn, which is something that over the offseason I highlighted. Look, I think it's possible Klingon steps out behind the three-point line. He's got a really good free throw um, you know, shot technique, and he's somebody who his shot mechanics I would trust to shoot threes. Now, he hasn't made one yet at the time I'm recording this mock draft, but I think that's something that's coming for him, and he's just massive. He's a he's a true seven-footer. He offers a lot of size, strength. He's good around the rim. He's shooting over 65% from the field this year for UConn, and he's just been really reliable. It rebounds well, blocks shots. He's just a, a classic true big man. Uh, I think if you were to give a comp for him, I think people would probably land in the comparison of Walker Kessler. And if you can picture, you know, that playing next to Victor Wembanyama, obviously we see a lot of Zach Collins right now. They just extended him, which is why I, I worried about drafting a center. Would the Spurs actually do that? And I thought about wings. I was like, well, they have Kelton Johnson, Devin Vassell, Jeremy Sohan. I don't know if I want to draft a wing either. I, I really, really struggle with this pick. I landed on Klingon because I think, you know, maybe you could argue best player available at this spot of the draft. Uh, you could also argue that, hey, you know, they only extended Collins for a couple of years. It gives time for Klingon to kind of develop. Victor Wembanyama um, gives him some time to develop. And then Klingon maybe is your front court pairing with Victor. Or maybe Klingon is just a long-term backup behind Victor, which sounds, yes, less appealing. But it's still a good thing to have two really good centers. 48 minutes of good center play is a luxury in the NBA. So if the Spurs were able to find a way to navigate that and and rock with that, that's a huge win for them. And I think Klingon's a guy who, with his screen setting and his rebounding capabilities, would be a really nice addition there in San Antonio. And we have the Atlanta Hawks, and I think they're an example of a team that rocked with two centers. After they drafted Inyeka Kongwu, who's been the long-term backup behind Clint Capella, I think that's worked relatively well for them. I would argue, you know, Inyeka Kongwu's played very well in his role. And at this pick, it's kind of a question of what do the Hawks need? Uh, they drafted Kobe Bufkin last year. So for me, I'm kind of ruling out guard. I don't think that they're going to draft a guard. They extended DeJounte Murray. They have Trey Young long-term is what I'm going to assume. 
maybe just maybe they don't we'll see if Trey Young gets traded or not um that's not reporting that's just me speculating and they have Kobe Bufkin I like those three guards for them then you look at the kind of their wings Sadiq Bey's a free agent they have AJ Griffin who's not really playing right now and then their center spot I already mentioned Capella they have Anyeka Kongwu I mean what do they need and how do they get better for me i just went with really intriguing prospect and a guy who i think could really help improve their team defense because of how good defensively he is as an individual and that is ryan dunn for the virginia cavaliers I have him 10th overall here because of his defensive ability he is averaging about 5.2 stocks per game that is 2.6 steals plus 2.6 blocks he's a dynamic defender and he's doing it for a program that really defends well historically. They typically have good defensive principles. They coach their guys up very well. And Don, listen, there are some real flaws in his game. He's shooting sub 27% from three right now. That is a big red flag. He doesn't shoot the ball very well for a wing. So you might say, uh-oh, why would we want to take a Ryan Dunn, a sophomore wing who can't shoot the basketball? Well, he just happens to be shooting about 77% on two-pointers. He is super efficient slashing. He just chooses his spots well, gets to spots on the floor where he can score. And honestly, if I had to give a draft comparison for him, probably be Herb Jones. And I loved Herb Jones coming out of his draft. I couldn't believe he was a second round pick. I had a solid first round grade on him. Uh, and obviously the Pelicans did really well scooping him up when they did. I think Ryan Dunn, I think the NBA has learned uh, from that mistake. And I think they're going to see a guy like Ryan Dunn and say, yeah, this guy's so versatile. This guy has to be a lottery pick. And I have him going 10th overall here in this mock draft. Pick number 11, we're back to the Portland Trailblazers. This pick comes from the Golden State Warriors through the Boston Celtics. This pick has been traded multiple times. This comes from the Drew Holiday trade to the Boston Celtics. And for me, again, here with the Blazers, I'm kind of looking for upside now at this spot. And I'm looking at a guy who was a really high high school recruit. Mike Schmitz, you know, he's been on the scene for a long time when it comes to, you know, not recruiting, but, you know, analyzing scouting prospects. He's well aware of this kid. He's been well aware of this kid for a long time. Really high-end, highly touted recruit. He hasn't had the best start to his collegiate season, but I'm not selling my stock on him fully yet. I have the Portland Trailblazers here, 11th overall, selecting Justin Edwards from Kentucky. He's shooting about 45% from the field. He's not shooting very well from three right now, but he's an athletic freak, and he's a guy who, off the wing, I think he's got the skill set that will keep teams intrigued in his upside long term and what he's capable of providing to an NBA roster, whether that's getting on the offensive glass, defending, making some defensive plays. Now, for him, he's still really young. He has to put all of those things together, and I think the shot making specifically is something we're still waiting for. If he was making shots right now, I think he'd be a, a solidified top seven, top six-ish pick. But right now he hasn't, so I have him sliding a little bit. I've seen other people, um, again, unsolicited on my timeline, whatever, having him in the 20s. And I just don't necessarily agree with that. As you guys know, for the entire history of my channel, I don't work off of consensus. I still get a lot of picks right. I still know exactly what I'm talking about. I spend so many, so many hours watching these players and you know evaluating them i know what their strengths are and i end up landing on the right answers a lot of the time whether that's you know mocking them to the right team or just my overall big board i still think justin edwards can be really good and i just think you know for a 10 game sample size if you're going to judge everything based off of shooting i don't really know what we're doing here i think edwards if you're looking at that from an eye test perspective he has the physical tools he has the traits he's willing to shoot he just hasn't made them enough yet for people to warrant him being a top seven, top eight-ish pick. I have him at 11 here. I feel like this is a really good upside pick for the Blazers, who, if you're looking for upside for them, this is probably about as good as it gets at this selection. Pick number 12, we have the Oklahoma City Thunder. This pick comes from the Houston Rockets from the Russell Westbrook Chris Paul swap. Do you feel old yet? That was so long ago. That's where this pick comes from, though. And 12th overall, Oklahoma City. This is a this is a really good you know, story here. This is a feel good story. And, and one that honestly, I do think just flat out makes sense with the 12th overall pick. I have the Oklahoma city thunder selecting Cody Williams from Colorado. He's putting together a pretty good freshman campaign. And this guy's got some swagger to him as well. Just like his brother, 
Jalen Williams, the Santa Clara wing, now kind of living it up, being you know a future star for the Oklahoma City Thunder. He's had some awesome performances this year again, kind of building off of that rookie season he had a year ago. And I think OKC adding another Williams to the bunch here, this time Cody, it, it just doesn't get better than this. Um, you know, with their long-term team construction, roster construction, the way that they're looking to build their team. The more perimeter talent, the better. They like being able to space teams out, drive the basketball, drive and kick, and they're able to put a lot of pressure on the defense by getting them to, you know, move around, rotate, forced into, you know, kind of crashing the defense and then having to scramble back out and contest shooters and then you get beat off the dribble again and again and again and I think Cody Williams really fits well into that uh, this year he's averaging a little bit over two assists a game about four rebounds I'd like to see him kind of have an uptick there in terms of his production both rebounding the basketball and assisting the basketball but I've been very impressed with what I've seen from him early film wise he can get to the rim and finish he's pretty comfortable uh, he's making a, a decent amount of his shots right now and because of that uh, his performance so far for Colorado I think has been impressive and I think he's a guy that is firmly in the lottery conversation and having him go 12th overall here to Oklahoma City to play with his brother just flat out feels right. Pick number 13 we have Oklahoma City on the clock again this pick comes from the Los Angeles Clippers and I really love this selection for them. One thing that I think Oklahoma City could use, and now this doesn't necessarily fit their team identity as much. The Cody Williams pick fits kind of what their draft strategy has been in recent years. But this is kind of a, hey, what are what's something we're lacking on the roster in the way that we're currently constructed? And for me, that's like a four-man who is athletic enough to protect the rim, play next to Chet Holmgren, but also can maybe play some small ball five and just offer you some different things while still being a potential screen and roll guy, potentially being a back cutter. That's Bobby Clintman here out of Kyron's Titans. He's playing in the NBL. Last year he played at Wake Forest. There was a lot of speculation last draft cycle that he had actually gotten a first round promise from a team and then all of a sudden he withdrew his name. And I think everyone went, whoa, what's going on here with Bobby Clintman? And then he ended up going over. He's an NBL next star right now. He's having a pretty good season for them. He's had some really timely shots. He's hit some big shots for them. And I think he's a player that is firmly in that top 20 discussion right now when it comes to mock drafts currently for the 2024 NBA draft. And I think he did well by kind of withdrawing, waiting a year, going overseas, getting more experience. And he's going to come back and I think his draft stock is going to be benefited by that. Last year, a lot of people expected him to be picked anywhere from 25 to 30. This year right now, I think, again, a likely top 20 pick and a good one at that here for Oklahoma City. I think Clintman fits well if they were to ever decide to start him. I think he could fit into their starting lineups because of the spacing that they have. And I think he gives them a little bit more length, size, versatility, and toughness that I think that they could use, um, as well as an intriguing skill set where he is hitting some of his shots right now. Um, he's able to handle the ball just a little bit, and defensively, he's got some of those traits that Alex Sar has, although he's just less reliable there, and I don't think he's quite as much of a guy you'd build your defense defense round instead of him just being a good team defender in general. Pick 14 now we move on to the New Orleans Pelicans and the Pelicans very strong win on Monday night over the Minnesota Timberwolves. Zion Williamson is an absolute beast but every time I watch the Pelicans my one big conclusion is they need a point guard. They need someone who is a real ball handler because at times they just get a little stagnant. If Zion Williamson isn't dominating his one-on-one -on -one matchup, it feels like, eh, what are we doing here a little bit? And do they have a guy to operate in the pick and roll and you know facilitate for others, but still be a scoring threat? CJ McCollum does that to a certain extent. Brandon Ingram does that to a certain extent. Zion does that to a certain extent. But here's a player that I think everyone is sleeping on. I've seen a lot more buzz for him lately. I'm a big believer in this kid, and he goes to a school that it's really, really safe to bet on their guards when they come out. 14th overall, I have the New Orleans Pelicans selecting Rob Dillingham from Kentucky, a player that I have become enamored with. He is shooting the ball so well to start the season, and it's on pretty good volume, and it's on ridiculous difficulty. And anytime you have a player shooting a lot of shots, and they're difficult shots and he's making a lot of them, it's probably a pretty good indicator that the kid can put the ball in the hoop. And that's what he's doing right now for Kentucky. I don't care that he's coming off the bench. Um, you know, people are gonna point to that and say, whoa, he's not even starting over DJ Wagner. You have him going before Wagner? Listen, the same thing happened at UCLA years ago where Zach Levine came off the bench behind Kyle Anderson. 
Just because that's the case doesn't mean he, that Zach Levine was a worse player than Kyle Anderson. It's just the way that the college coach operated. And if you look at Kentucky's guard history, it's ridiculous. I think Rob Dillingham is going to be another success story. And he's another example of an OTE prospect finding their way in the league. He played for the Cold Hearts uh, a year ago, competed against Amin and Osar Thompson, ended up losing in the overtime elite championship game to the City Reapers and the Thompson Twins. But I've been saying for a long time, <clears throat> this kid's got a really good handle. He's twitchy, he's quick, and he's a shot maker. And listen, people are going to point to the size and say, oh, he's little. Listen, I completely understand, and I think that's a legitimate concern. You, your dream scenario is getting a super quick six foot five player who can handle pass and shoot. That's like the best case scenario. Not everyone's built that way. And we've seen a lot of the guards who aren't built that way become stars in the league. Darius Garland, I think a recent example of that, where he's only about six foot one and he's really, really light. That's the thing, you know, people are going to point to for Rob Dillingham. I don't really care. The kid can handle, the kid can shoot. And I think he's a growing passer and I think he's a willing passer. And when you have a willing passer who's getting better, I think you're able to see something where the player's going to get good at passing at some point. Now, maybe they're not going to be a 10 assist per game player. They're not going to be Tyrese Halliburton as a facilitator, but you can coach them. And I think that's a big thing here for New Orleans. Finding a guard like Rob Dillingham could just be really, really dangerous for this team. And honestly, be a really nice acquisition for this Pelicans team. Moving on to pick number 15 now, we have the Phoenix Suns on the clock. And with the Phoenix Suns here, obviously you would expect them to be a little bit higher up in the standings. But with the injuries that we knew coming into the year, they were likely going to sustain. Bradley Beals missed a ton of time. Somehow Kevin Durant's been super healthy, but Devin Booker, he's been dealing with some of his own injuries as well. We knew that the Suns big three that was highly anticipated wouldn't likely spend a lot of time together on the floor. And because of that, the Suns have struggled to find their footing. And I also think because of that, you could realistically look at anything across the lineup. Could you find a center here with this pick? Could you find a quality forward, a wing, or even a, a ball handler, a point guard for when one of these three stars is not playing that's valuable here for Phoenix. So I think that they should really go BPA, best player available. And with the 15th overall pick, we have the Phoenix Suns here selecting Tyrese Proctor out of Duke, the Australian born guard. I was expecting him to have a little bit more statistical output this season. We've seen Kyle Filipowski for Duke take a step forward. I was expecting Proctor to take a bigger leap forward himself. Not to say he hasn't, he's improved his efficiency significantly, especially on two-point shot attempts. The three-point shot's still a little hit or miss here at this point, but with his size, his playmaking feel, I expected him to be racking up some more assists. Now, he's averaging about four and a half assists. That is an entire assist more per game than what he averaged a year ago, and I still think that from my eye test, he's got a creative handle. He's a guy that can work in an NBA offense as a creator for others, and I think really the, the big swing for him is how efficient can he become as a self-made shooter? Is he able to create for himself off the dribble consistently? And if he is able to, he's got plus size. He's got the handle to create some shot you know, opportunities. Is he able to knock them down? And if, if so, you're looking at a home run pick here for Phoenix and a player that could fit in the backcourt long-term with Devin Booker while also probably bringing some stability given the fact that he's a multi-year college player uh, and I think honestly could get some run with Phoenix as early as next season. Pick 16 now, we have the Miami Heat here at this pick and this is a selection I absolutely love for them. Kind of the counterpoint to Phoenix. I think Miami just perennially should be looking for more scoring talent and, and guys who can put the ball in the hoop because Eric Spolster does such a great job coaching up team defense. When you have Bam Adebayo behind you, it helps. He's super switchable, really good rim protector. You have Jimmy Butler, who's a really good point of attack defender still at this point of his career, especially when he decides to turn it on. Caleb Martin, strong, physical, just really well coached team as well. They go to zone more than any other team in the league. And that's why I think this pick specifically makes a ton of sense for them. 16th overall, I have the Miami Heat selecting Judah Mintz out of Syracuse. Now Syracuse runs a ton of zone as well. And Judah Mintz is a flat out bucket. This guy should be firmly in the conversation for potential lottery selection. He's averaging over 20 points a game right now for the orange. And by the way, he's shooting the ball very, very well, shooting above 40% from three on ridiculous volume. He's averaging almost four assists per game. He's actually down a little bit this year in terms of assists, but I still think, you know, with the way he's taking care of the basketball, the shot selection, the difficulty, the fact that he creates so many shots, 
This is the exact point guard prospect that I think the Miami Heat should consider. He has a, he's accustomed to playing zone defense. The Heat run zone about 25% of the time. That's a, that's a good player to implement in. I think you're going to be able to coach him up on the zone side of things really, really quickly. Now, he is, again, very similar to Rob Dillingham, smaller, lighter. You know, there are some concerns there. But with his ability to fill it up and put the basketball in the hoop, he's the type of player that I think Miami could really use. I'm super high on Judah Mintz. I like this kid. I think he can flat out play. I think he's an NBA guard. I think he's going to potentially be a starting point guard in the league in his rookie season, depending on what team he lands on. I think Miami would be one of the situations where Judah Mintz might be good enough to start for them pretty quickly on into his career. And I would be very, very fascinated to see his career play out if he lands with the Miami Heat, just based on his talent, his shot making. He's got some aura to him as well. And I think when you're outside the lottery, the upside of a player like Judah Mintz is just too immense to pass up on. They had a nice pick with Jaime Jaquez. Um, just really impressive how well he's played as a rookie. And I think if you're looking to address the point guard spot, Judah Mintz is the guy to me that really stands out at this selection. Pick 17, we have the Houston Rockets here. Now this pick comes from the Brooklyn Nets. And one big concern I had for Houston coming into this year was the shooting from behind the arc. Now, listen, they've had some awesome moments this season so far. Jalen Green's averaging over 20 points a game. He's shooting the ball a little bit better as well from the field, which I love to see. Uh, Fred Van Vliet, Dylan Brooks were both very good additions for this team. I tried telling everyone over the offseason, look, I thought Houston got a lot better, and they definitely did. Um, they've been really great at home. They've struggled on the road. That's pretty typical for young teams and just teams in general. You know, playing at home is a lot easier than playing on the road, but I think Houston, you know, as they progress, Progress as they mature a little bit more, they're going to get better playing on the road. And as long as they can defend home court, we're looking at a potential playoff team, which would be awesome to see. Now, I'm not sure if they're going to get there or not, and it's okay if they don't. The whole point of this season was to just be a better team, and they've definitely risen to that level. And this picks a, a nice opportunity for them to get a little bit better and address one of their big needs, which is more shooting, more perimeter shot making uh, off the catch and off the dribble. And that's a guy here out of Kentucky that I have been very impressed with. 17th overall, I have the Houston Rocket, Rockets select Reed Shepard, who has just been remarkable. Parts of his game reminds me of Austin Reeves playing at Oklahoma, just kind of the way he handles the basketball, his crossovers. I know people are going to say, well, it's because he's white. Well, that might play into it a little bit too, but just, you know, there's like a nuance in the way that they handle the basketball. They set guys up when they're handling in a pick and roll. And just Reed Shepard's been very, very impressive this season. Um, and I've really enjoyed watching him play. Um, with Kentucky, I think there was a lot of expectations that, hey, DJ Wagner, Rob Dillingham, those would be the two dynamic lead guards for them. Well, Reed Shepard at times has been their best guard. Now, I did have Dillingham go before Shepard in this mock, but I think Shepard's maybe the safer pick. I think Shepard's maybe the you know, more reliable pick if you're playing him off the ball or on the ball. I think there's a little bit more that he can give you. Dillingham's got a little bit more of that spark plug microwave type score attribute to him, whereas Shepard's kind of a guy who off the ball, he can catch, shoot, catch fire, catch off the, you know, off the catch and, and attack. And um, I think he's a growing passer and I've been very impressed with his game so far this season. I think he would be excellent in Houston. Um, and I could see really a long-term trio of the backcourt being Amon Thompson, Jalen Green and Reed Shepard. Those three guys playing together for the next five to seven years, I think would be really, really good for Houston. And I think, you know, kind of, you know, helps their infrastructure that they already have in place um, there in Houston. Pick number 18, we move on to the New York Knicks who, hey, listen, I've been, I've been pretty impressive uh, or impressed, excuse me, by Jalen Brunson's play again this year. Um, last year, it really, really impressed me. I think it was even harder coming back this season with the idea that, look, teams are ready for you now. Teams know that, hey, you might be the number one option and we have to worry about this all-star level guard. And he's played great again. Um, and I've, I've loved seeing that as a Mavericks fan myself. Um, it's been a lot of fun watching Jalen Brunson thrive in his own setting, his own situation. And I'm very, very happy for him. And this pick at all is not a concern about whether or not Brunson's the long-term point guard, but we are going to go with a scorer here and, and a point guard, someone who can handle the basketball. Um, DJ Wagner out of Kentucky. We have a kind of a run on Kentucky guards here in the teens. We have Dillingham, Shepard, and now Wagner goes. And Wagner coming in was 
probably the prospect that most people assume to be the first off the board out of these three. He's actually the last one here in my mock draft. He's not shooting the ball very well right now, shooting about 41% from the field. Um, three point shots just not falling with regularity, but I have been impressed by his ability to set up his teammates. Uh, he's been a very solid passer, I think, this year for Kentucky. Uh, and I think he's playing into Calipari's system very, very well, where, hey, if you get a paint touch, look out, look, see if you can spray it out to a shooter. I think he's done that very, very well. I think he creates advantage. He just hasn't paid off some of those advantages as much as you would like to see. So I think for a team like the Knicks, who, you know, given all of their young guys, there's been all this speculation about trade who knows maybe they don't even make this pick but if they do have this selection maybe selecting a guy like DJ Wagner opens up an opportunity for Emmanuel quickly to be involved in a deal or Quentin Grimes to be involved in a deal who's kind of been a little up and down this year um, himself so I think the Knicks 18th overall grabbing DJ Wagner there's a lot of upside I think he can create his own shot he can create shots for others and because of that I think that warrants a selection here 18th overall um, in a player that you feel pretty good about finding something out of uh, a few years down the road, probably after some more developmental time early in his career. Pick number 19, we move on to the Indiana Pacers and what an in-season tournament run they had, huh? They were so much fun to watch. I love watching Tyrese Halbert, one of my favorite players in the league to watch. Uh, he's just such a cerebral guard. Uh, I loved him coming out of Iowa State. If you go back to all my um, 2020 commentary and, you know, I've posted on Twitter even some of my takes on Halliburton, um, you know, showing what I had written about him pre-draft and, and just how impressed I was with his ability to command a game. Um, it was crazy to me that people didn't view him as a true point guard. I just couldn't believe that when he came out of the draft. And, and 19th overall, I think this is a player who's going to complement their roster uh, relatively well. It's Trenton Flowers who's playing over in the NBL for the Adelaide 36ers. Um, he had actually decommitted from an American college, uh, decided to go over there as an NBL next star, and it's paid off pretty well. He's had some really good impact performances. Um, in the NBL, they actually track a stat called impact rating, uh, and he's been toward the top of the league a lot um, there because of his production, his performance, and some of the big shots he's hit as well. Um, for the 36ers this season, he's been really a nice, uh, a nice pleasant piece for them um, and has had some awesome moments, um, including a, a double-digit scoring fourth quarter earlier this season. I, I think Trenton Flowers, with his size, he continues to grow. He's about 6'8", 6'9", roughly. Uh, he's a player who he's shooting very, very well. Uh, the point guard experience did not work for him. He just, he's not a point guard, um, which they tried him at that. He's more comfortable playing off the ball, catching and shooting, playing off the catch. That is perfectly okay, especially in Indiana here when you already have guys like TJ McConnell, uh, Andrew Nemhard, Tyrese Halliburton, you have Reed Shepard, who I think is going to be able to handle the ball quite a bit for them. Trent Flowers fits right in off the wing. And I think with his size, shot making that he's flashed this year so far, uh, I have him firmly in the top 20 conversation. I know other people have him quite a bit lower. I don't care. I think Trent Flowers is a good player. I think he's somebody who's going to be able to impact winning at the NBA level. I think the NBL is a very, very good developmental uh, system. You already saw in this mock, I had a guy go first overall from the NBL, uh, and now I have a guy going 19th. I, I just do believe in the league. I think that they do a great job mirroring and mimicking the NBA style, and I think Trenton Flowers is going to walk into the NBA, maybe with a little bit of an advantage over some of these college prospects because of his pro experience, and I think that's a, a good thing for him and the team drafting him, in this case, the Indiana Pacers. Pick 20 now, we have the Atlanta Hawks on the board. Once again here, remember 10th overall, we have the Hawks go with Ryan Dunn out of Virginia. And now for the Hawks at this spot, this pick comes from the Sacramento Kings, by the way. Who would I have them pick? And I think for me, I landed here on Kyle Filipowski out of Duke. 20th overall. And the reason why I landed with Flip here at this pick uh, is just he's a versatile player, versatile skill set. He can handle the ball at the point a little bit for you, given his size as a, a seven footer. Um, and I think he's an impressive piece because of his ability to knock down perimeter shots. He isn't doing so at a high rate right now, only making about 25 to 27% of his threes. Um, as a sophomore, though, he's putting up about 20 points a game. He's really comfortable in that Duke system, and he's a real big part of the Duke system. Uh, without him, I think Duke would be a little bit more shaky this season. I think he's provided some real stability for them. Uh, and he's a player that, listen, if he didn't come out in this draft, I would completely understand it because he might have great college player written all over him, where he's a four-year guy in college, super comfortable. He's cashing in on NIL right now, and he's just playing great basketball. 
there's nothing wrong with that. But I do think if he does jump to the NBA, he's kind of a mid to late first round consideration guy. And if a team likes him, like Atlanta maybe does, I think there's a fit here where he's able to stretch the floor for a team and, and provide some things for them that their centers currently don't do as much. Konwu, Capella, they don't shoot the ball like that. So Filipowski gives you a different style center um, and maybe a, an option that would work pretty well there in Atlanta. Pick 21, we have the Cleveland Cavaliers now, and the Cavs do have some long-term questions, whether that's you know about Donovan Mitchell staying there, is Jared Allen going to be the long-term center, or is Evan Mobley the long-term center? What does that really look like? There's a lot of conversations right now, but a feel-good story would be exactly what I'm painting here in this picture. 21st overall, I have the Cleveland Cavaliers selecting Bronny James out of USC, who just made his college debut. And that's one reason I'm glad I was sick last week, because I ended up getting to wait, got to watch Bronny James debut. And I know people are gonna, you know, troll the stats. So he didn't score that much, he didn't put up a lot of stats. The kid's a first round player. And I know people are gonna say, oh my God, LeBron James Jr., that's why he's in this draft, because you got LeBron's name. No, it has nothing to do with that. If Trust me, I watch all of these players. I mocked Trenton Flowers for no reason other than the fact that he's good. I mocked Kyle Filipowski for no other reason other than he's good. I am mocking Bronny James because he's good. Now, I'm mocking him to Cleveland here because it's fun, but I also think he kind of fits what Cleveland needs. Another guard who can defend gives them really good positional athleticism and defensive versatility, and I think they could use that next to Darius Garland and next to Donovan Mitchell if Mitchell is a long-term Cavalier. Um, and I think Bronny James, um, obviously, you know, maybe there's a chance LeBron returns back to Cleveland as well. That's that's part of what makes this one fun here in this mock. But Bronny James is a first-round player. Uh, he's got a really quick first step. He's a, he's a quality shooter. Um, he's a connector. If I had to give a comparison for him, he'd be like a poor man's Derek White. Now, doesn't sound great spending a first round pick on someone who's compared to a poor man's version of somebody, but a poor man's Derek White is still a very, very good NBA player. And I think Bronny James is going to turn into that. Honestly, um, with this being a mock draft, I'm kind of roughly mocking where I would expect them to go. Bronny James probably seems like a pick in the 20s right now. To me, if I was actually drafting myself, I would strongly consider him around the top 10. Um, kind of in the Justin Edwards territory of things right now, um, maybe over Bobby Clintman, for example, because I think that Bronny James, not only would he help our team sell tickets and not only would he perhaps help convince LeBron James to come play for your franchise, but I think just looking at him from a, a talent perspective, he defends, he shoots, he's comfortable as a secondary playmaker, and those that, that combination of skills is invaluable. And I think that's something that could really help a team significantly. Um, he jumps out of the gym. He's extremely athletic. I think he's going to keep getting better at time uh, with time. He's somebody who I think he's really, really smart, um, reads the game well, feels the game well. And because of that, I would put stock in him. And I, I do believe in Bronny James. I think he's going to have a good NBA career and I would draft him higher than I even have him going in this mock draft myself. Pick 22, we have the Knicks here. This pick comes from the Dallas Mavericks. And with this selection, I have them taking a player I like quite a bit as well, Isan Almansa uh, from G League Ignite. I really do believe in this kid as well. He's got really good positional feel as kind of a center slash tweener forward, like power forward center type. He's able to handle the basketball a bit. He's got a, a very unique collection of skills for his size given the fact that he can pass the basketball he can attack downhill he's got a floater uh, he plays with pretty good touch and right now he's in the best shape of his life i think one question around him was can he stay in an athletic shape like where he's going to be able to keep up with nba athletes and i think he's trending in the right direction in that area and for me with the knicks right now you know given the fact that they moved off of obi top in this last year um, just a few picks ago, we had him take DJ Wagner. I thought a little bit of a, a front court boost here with Almansa could be pretty good. And I think he could actually end up becoming a better version of Isaiah Hartenstein, who I know the Knicks really, really like. Hartenstein took quite a few years to develop. Remember, he was on the Rockets, then got over to the Clippers before ultimately finding his true footing in the league with the Knicks. Um, I think Almansa could, could be a guy who follows a similar career trajectory where it takes him a couple of years to really figure out who he is in the league. But once he does, he's going to be a good player. Um, centers take a while to develop. I think Almansa is a player who I would have on my radar, and I think he could really help a team like the New York Knicks uh, significantly. Pick 23, we have the Denver Nuggets here who have stumbled a little bit this season. 
Typically, we expect them to be right around pick number 30 in these mock drafts. But at 23, I think really all the Nuggets are looking to do here um, is Dylan Jones out of Weber State. And I like this selection a lot for them because... He's a pro-ready player. He rebounds the ball extremely well, gives you a versatile forward who can defend a couple, across a couple of positions. And just like they did a year ago, drafting Julian Strother and Hunter Tyson, they're looking for more players who can play off of their best guy, off of Nikola Jokic. They're looking for cheap NBA-ready talent. Drafting Dylan Jones, you're going to get him on a cheap rookie-scale contract. You're going to get some of the best years of his career on a rookie deal because he's already in his, you know, kind of early-ish to mid-20s, um, about 22, 23 years old on draft night. And I think he's going to be a, a nice player. He's averaging about 20 and 10 this season for Weber State. Kind of just more of the same from what we saw a year ago. I think he's an NBA-ready contributor. The Nuggets take him, put him into their lineup pretty quickly on, just like they've done with Julian Strother, and they find some pretty early success around, again, yes, Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr., Aaron Gordon, and their just overall existing core that they already have in place. Pick 24, we move on to the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, important to note, the New Orleans Pelicans actually have um, an option to take this pick or defer it to 2025. My assumption right now, just based on how the narrative is around draft classes, and, and in my opinion, 2025 is a stronger draft class than 2024, um, just especially at the top. If I was the Pelicans, I would defer the pick. There's always a chance that maybe the Lakers season falls apart a year from now. Maybe you get a higher pick. And if you get a high pick in 2025, you feel really good. They let the Lakers keep this pick here at 24. And the Lakers then in turn take Khalil Ware out of Indiana. And I've been super impressed with this kid. He's just been playing really great basketball for the Hoosiers. And I tried telling everyone before the year... This kid's going to be good. I highlighted him as a player who I thought could be a big riser in this draft cycle. Um, I have him at 24 right now. He's a true seven-footer who's able to handle the basketball. He's got some electric downhill capabilities. I think he could be a really good screen and roll guy, an above-the-rim finisher. Um, he is pretty light. I think that's something that you know we got to see him take steps forward in. But he's also a player who he's shooting threes right now. He's not shooting a ton, but he's shooting a few, and he's made a couple as well. So you're looking at a player who, for the Hoosiers, has been a essential in replacing Trace Jackson Davis, uh, who was a monster for them the last couple of years. Khalil Ware transferred in from Oregon, didn't really find the role he was looking for with the Oregon Ducks a year ago, and now in his sophomore season, he's really found his footing, putting up the numbers I think everyone knew he was capable of, and it's really great to see him finding success, and I think for the Lakers, they're, you know, long term they've been battling with the, is Anthony Davis center, is Anthony Davis power forward? Drafting a center like Khalil Ware gives you another body to throw in there, protect the rim, be lengthy, strong, big, uh, and you know, kind of do some of the dirty work that centers have to do while Anthony Davis gets to play his finesse style of game from night to night occasions. You still get to play AD at center when you want to, but Ware can eat up some of those center minutes when AD either needs a night off or when AD um, is playing more of his finesse, you know, pace and space and, and shoot jumpers type of game. Pick 25, we have the Indiana Pacers on the clock again here. Remember earlier we went with Trenton Flowers for the Pacers. And with this pick, it's about finding a guard who can shoot for them. And listen, I considered front court players. They just drafted Jairus Walker a year ago. We gave them Trenton Flowers, who has some good positional size, kind of like a, a hybrid shooting guard, small forward maybe. Here I'm going with kind of a, a combo guard in Jared McCain out of Duke. This is a real trade spot, in my opinion, for the Pacers. They get this pick from Oklahoma City from their trade uh, last draft, where they moved out of their pick um, and got the swap worst rights here for this one. I think Jared McCain uh, could be a nice piece. He's shooting over 41% right now from three for Duke. Now, he's not shooting very well inside the arc, but one thing about Indiana is around Halliburton, around Miles Turner, and some of their core pieces, they want to be able to shoot the three ball well. That's always been a big part of Rick Carlisle's identity as a head coach in the modern era, and I think having McCain could contribute to that. Again, I think this is a potential trade spot. The Pacers are a team that this deadline could really look to make some moves, make some noise um, in the trade market, and I think this pick would be something that would be attainable for a team like the Raptors per se if it was around OG Ananobi or Pascal Siakam but nonetheless the Pacers here Jared McCain I think would be a really nice option um, for his overall skill set out of a guard position next to Halliburton. Here at pick 26 we have the Philadelphia 76ers and at this selection right now um, I really like this they're actually going to take a kid who's playing his college basketball in Pennsylvania he's playing for the uh, Pittsburgh Panthers and I think he's a player who 
Um, I've been very impressed with Carlton Bub Carrington. Bub is his little nickname. In his very first college game, he actually put up a triple-double um, in really impressive performance. And this year, he's averaging uh, a pretty good amount of points, around 15 points a game, about five rebounds a night, five assists a night. And he's just a player who impacts winning. Now, I think there's a few things we would like to see him do better. I think his three-point shot specifically could come around quite a bit, but he's been pretty efficient as a two-point scorer. And because of that, I think just given his overall ability to impact the game, versatility is going to be king for the 76ers. This is also a massive trade piece, whether they trade it this year at the trade deadline or on draft night to get some type of big deal done for a star. That'll be, you know, a big question that we have to wait and see for with the 76ers. But a guy like Bub Carrington could be really nice for them because he could be employed in a bunch of different ways. Could he be a backup ball handler for you? Yes. Could he be in an, a wing piece because he's able to crash out of the corner and grab some offensive rebounds with his size and rebounding anticipation. 100% he could. So I think because of that, there's some different ways you can use him. And I think it opens up uh, the pathways here for the Sixers to uh, find some real success in the draft while staying cheap on their roster as they look to add some big names this offseason. Pick 27, we have the Orlando Magic here now. And wow, what a feel-good story this team's been, huh? Uh, Jalen Suggs has been a dynamite defensive player for them. Um, that was really one of my big things I loved about him coming out of his draft. My comparison for him was Drew Holiday coming out of his draft because of his ability to defend. I'm not sure if he'll ever live up to Drew Holiday's offensive output, although I would say Drew Holiday's been a little bit of an overrated offensive player throughout his career, just a bit. Um, I think that Jalen Suggs is a guy who is really, really great. Uh, Franz Wagner is playing fantastic. I highlighted him a little bit earlier uh, when I compared Matas Buzelis to him in this mock draft. Um, and I also think Paulo Boncaro just, you know, kind of more of the same with what we saw last year. Really good player, can put the ball in the deck, and he's defending this season. That's a big reason why the Magic have been so good. And what would be something that I could see Orlando going with? Listen, they found a lot of success so far this year with Goga Batadze playing and filling in at the center spot with Wendell Carter Jr. out. But I think if you're going for an upside pick, this is a guy who coming into this draft cycle, people kind of presume maybe a top five, top 10-ish pick. He falls all the way down to 27 here. Ade Mara from Spain. He's playing his college basketball at UCLA. Um, listen, there's some real flaws with him. Defensively, uh, his pick and roll defensive coverage is not good. He's not super mobile. That's what you're going to typically expect from a seven foot three big. But you're drafting this guy because of his offensive skill set. I think if there's one area Orlando could use a lot more help in, it's offensive half court scoring. And I think that's where Ade Mara could help them quite a bit because of his ability to pass the basketball out of the post. He's so big and lengthy that he gives you a real post up threat. If you get him close to the hoop, he's going to be very tough to stop. And I think Ade Mara is a, a guy who. Listen, there's there's going to be some real flaws with his game, but at 27, can you sell yourself on the upside of, look, this could be a guy that we do feed the basketball to. Who else in the 20s are you you know, finding a, a player that maybe you run some of your half-court offense through? Is this kind of a, a poor man's version of Alper and Shangun, or is this kind of a, a, a reignite the lamp of Nikola Vucevic in Orlando, except this time you actually have a really good defense around him, you have a lot of good pieces, and can a Demara maybe be a bench spark plug? Or, or what, what can he be? I think there's a lot of questions right now. There ha there's a lot more time left in the college season. This is not, he's not a finished product. He's, you know, first of all, he's making a really tough transition. He's coming from overseas, playing college basketball. Like, I think we have to give some grace to that as well and look at his situation and say, I don't think we've seen really the best of Ade Mara yet. He's adjusting to the college game, adjusting to a brand new lifestyle, new place to live. It, it's a big adjustment for him. And I think if you're looking for upside here, his skill set specifically intrigues me at this spot of the draft. Moving on to pick 28 now, we have the Milwaukee Bucks here. And I think one pretty evident issue of this team's roster construction, even though they've been winning a lot of games, Damian Lillard's been fantastic in the clutch. Giannis is Giannis, and he's really, really good at basketball. I think one of the big clear issues with the way that this team is constructed is they just don't have a lot of perimeter defensive options. They don't have as much length and size as we're used to seeing from them. Um, and it's been pretty clear when you're asking Malik Beasley to cover the other team's best option. I think, you know, Andre Jackson Jr. has been a real positive for them. Marjan Bochamp has had his moments when he's been healthy. 
Obviously, no Jay Crowder right now definitely hurts as well. But 28th overall here, I have the Milwaukee Bucks going with Baba Miller from Florida State, originally from Mallorca, Spain. Um, this is actually his sophomore season in college. Last year, I thought, hey, maybe he's a late first-round pick last year. Uh, just didn't end up having the season uh, that he was hoping to have. Stayed in college, and it was a really good decision for him. So far, through about eight or nine games, he's hitting on 40% of his threes, which is a significant improvement from a year ago. He's shooting about three threes a game, which again is another uptick from the like one and a half threes he shot per game last year. So not only is he shooting more of them, he looks a lot more comfortable shooting them and they're going in a lot more frequently. Now, am I going to bet my life and bet my house on that and say, oh, Bob Miller's a 40% three point shooter? Definitely not. First of all, that's the college three point line. And secondly, it's you know kind of more open shots. And I, I don't know if I trust it on a night to night basis. But that's really his swing skill. What he does best is defend. He's super lengthy. He's about seven feet tall um, as a wing type player. Uh, he's just a really unique piece in this draft. And if you're looking for a guy who, you know, if Milwaukee's looking to add more length and, and defensive versatility, there's possessions where Baba Miller literally guards all five guys because they switch a ton at FSU. It's been a big part of Leonard Hamilton's defense for a long time there. Uh, switchability is always king, and Baba Miller is probably one of the more switchable players he's ever had. Uh, defends well in the perimeter, has good footwork, can block shots at the rim. Obviously, his length is devastating for uh, opposing offensive players. And I think he's a, a player that, as long as he keeps growing offensively a little bit, could he be a poor man's Jonathan Isaac? And if so, that's a, that's a home run pick for Milwaukee here, 28th overall. Um, just with what their current needs are, getting a guy like Baba Miller could fill them pretty quickly. Pick 29, the Boston Celtics here now, and I really, really love this team. I've been super high on this team for a very long time. As soon as they got Kristaps Porzingis, they became my instant pick to win the NBA Finals because of the way that their roster is constructed. I just like this team. But one thing that I do think that they need long-term is another big man into the rotation. While Luke, Cornor Luke Cornett's played well for them this year, I still think that they could use another body, another reliable big man to rebound, um, crash the glass, score around the rim, um, and be that kind of traditional inside center. Even though, yes, Boston loves to play five out, they love to pace and space and, and shoot the three ball, I still think another guy who can exert rim pressure would be really nice for them. And this player was a, a potential top you know, 14 pick, potential lottery pick coming into this draft cycle. He actually missed the beginning of the season for the Kentucky Wildcats, but he's been playing um, as of late. And he's had some impressive performances. 29th overall, I have the Boston Celtics taking Aaron Bradshaw out of Kentucky. Uh, and my instant comparison for him is Isaiah Jackson, who plays for the Indiana Pacers. Um, and I really like Ijax. I, you know, I joke around with all the Pacers fans here on the channel saying I'll never, ever sell my Ijax stock. I loved him when he came out of Kentucky. I thought I thought I, Isaiah Jackson was going to be a dominant pick and roll center. And at moments he is. He's got really great above the rim finishing tools. And I think Aaron Bradshaw, just body type wise, looks like him, plays like him. And I think really mirrors some of his skills in a, in a way that very reminiscent. Uh, Isaiah Jackson went 22nd overall in, uh, I believe, the 2020 NBA draft. Aaron Bradshaw here going 29th is an absolute steal, in my opinion. I think he could really help the Boston Celtics, give them that inside center, a good screen and roll guy, someone who can hit the glass, um, eat up some of those center minutes throughout the regular season, keep guys like Kristaps Porzingis and Al Horford healthy by doing some of the dirty work. Um, and I think with the Celtics' big men collection right now, you could play Porzingis next to Aaron Bradshaw. Now, I don't think you're going to get the best version of Porzingis doing so, um, but I think having a guy like Bradshaw in the rotation is really, really good and I think would be very beneficial for the Celtics long term. Now pick 30, the final pick of the first round, and I want everyone right now to type I'm sorry in the comment section because I remember how many people were super low on the Rudy Gobert trade. I was not one of them. I actually loved the Rudy Gobert trade when it happened for the Timberwolves. Um, and I said it was genius for Minnesota when they pulled it off. Now, obviously, it took a year. Carl Anthony Towns missed so much time last season. But the Wolves have the best record in the NBA. They've got the best defense in the NBA. Rudy Gobert is playing at, like a defensive player of the year candidate. Um, and not only candidate, favorite. Uh, right now, if the, the season were to end today, he would win his fourth defensive player of the year. He's probably the best defender of this generation. Him or Draymond Green, you could make a real argument. Both of them, you know, very different from each other, but both of them very, very good in their own right. And 30th overall, the Timberwolves here, listen, the Timberwolves have a real obvious need. They, have, they need more shooting and they need more point guard play. 
that is 100% clear to me. Um, I, I'm very, very close in proximity to the Timberwolves. I, I really understand this roster. I understand this team. I know all of their offensive sets. I know everything that the Timberwolves do. I'm, I'm also telling you, me and Tim Connolly think very, very similarly. Pretty much er any time Tim Connolly has made a decision, um, I've agreed with it, uh, which is maybe an indication that I need to get a different hobby because I'm spending way too much time thinking about what GMs are thinking about. But 30th overall here, this is not what they need, but this is what I would expect them to do in this situation. The Minnesota Timberwolves select Dylan Mitchell out of Texas. I have, I've just been in love with this kid for a long time. Just like I loved Leonard Miller in the last draft. And then Tim Connolly took him and you know referenced his G League production and how good he was last year in the G League Ignite program. I think Dylan Mitchell's production this year shows a significant uptick in the player that he is. He's shooting some more mid-range jump shots. He's scoring the basketball more. He's scoring efficiently. And really the big thing for me, there's two elements that really showcase to me what this kid can become. He's rebounding the basketball at a much better rate. He's averaging about nine rebounds a game. So he's harnessing his athleticism and using it to hit the glass. He's also playing more minutes. So that's partially the reason why as well. He's playing about 30 minutes a game now for Texas. He's just been fantastic for them. And he's averaging about two blocks per game. And with his athleticism, I think his defensive activity, ability to hit the glass, um, and his ability as a dunker spot sitter uh, is going to be great. And I know people are going to say, whoa, dunker spot sitter. That's not what the Timberwolves need. They already have Rudy Gobert. First of all, they do a great job making their spacing work, even with Gobert, and it's because the Wolves this year are using a lot more vertical spacing, throwing the ball up above the rim where Gobert can go catch it and other guys can't. I think Dylan Mitchell gives you another element of that. That guy gets like 12 feet up in the air, I swear. Um, he's so athletic. He's such a joy to watch. Um, and honestly, if I had to give a comparison for him, I think he's a better Jared Vanderbilt. And if you're a Lakers fan, you know how good Jared Vanderbilt is um, and how important he is. If, you watched, if you're a Jazz fan, you watch Jared Vanderbilt. If you're a Wolves fan, you watch Jared Vanderbilt. You know how good of a player Jared Vanderbilt is. Dylan Mitchell's a better version. He's souped up. He's more athletic. I think he's a better shot blocker. I think he's a, a better rebounder. Um, maybe not offensively, but defensively he's a better rebounder. And I think that there's a lot of things Dylan Mitchell can do that are going to impact winning at the NBA level. And a lot of fans won't see it. They won't understand what Dylan Mitchell does. They won't understand what makes Dylan Mitchell really, really great at basketball, but GMs do. And I think Tim Connolly is a, a person who thinks the game very similarly that I, in the way that I do. Um, and with the way that he's built teams in the past, you could tell he likes size. And I think Dylan Mitchell fits kind of the size athleticism profile that Tim Connolly's looking for, even though it's not the Wolves' biggest need. Hopefully you guys did enjoy today's video. I had a lot of fun recording. Again, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content. Check out the previous video and my suggested video as well. Don't forget to leave a like, like I said. Hopefully you guys enjoy. If you got to this part of the, the video, Comment hashtag mock draft 24 down in the comment section. That way I know you made it all the way to the end. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.